The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams The podcast versions of the original Facebook Live readings during the coronavirus outbreak by Matthew Ogden, The Bearded Wit. Please bear in mind that as Facebook Live recordings, these are rough and ready, there are mistakes, there are a few trip-ups here and there, and there is laughter from the reader as he goes through and follows the humour himself along with you, the listener. We hope you enjoy listening to these and share liberally. Part 24 Before we start um, the actual reading, I just wanted to share a couple of bits of news uh, with you. Um, uh, Tonight's reading I'd like to uh, dedicate to... My friend Chris Jolly, who um, I've got the Giggle Fix hat on, he is my partner in crime uh, with um, the Giggle Fix channel on which I cross-post this uh, This too. We do silly and absurd things. Um, and, and unfortunately, uh, there has been a bit of a tragedy in his family. Um, I won't go into too much detail because it's private. Um, but I wanted to dedicate it to Chris and his family um, because he's a, he's a good bloke. Um, uh, and if you could sort of send out some positive thoughts in his direction, um, I would appreciate that a lot. And also my mum, uh, I'm not sure if she's able to listen. She wrote to me earlier. She's one of my dedicated listeners. She unfortunately had a bit of a fall um, on, on Friday and has, has hurt herself. She's OK. Um, she is healing, um, but she has been in and out of hospital and she's damaged her shoulder and her arm uh, quite a bit. Um, so if you've got some spare uh, in your uh, in your, all of your um, um, systems to share some positivity with people in the world, I would really appreciate that. So, um, so I'd like to dedicate this reading to uh, to Chris and his family, uh, and to send love to to him and his family, and also uh, to my mum. And uh, lots of best wishes for getting well soon, mum. Uh, look after yourself. Um, so enough of that. Um, thank you all uh, for listening in um i really appreciate the support um uh, before we start i'd also like to again um put an appeal out to you to support uh, me with uh, becoming uh, a patron of the bearded wit on uh, www.patreon.com the bearded wit uh, i've had a few people signing up in the last week and it's really lovely to see you um supporting what i'm doing um as i say your monthly um support at, uh, starts at five dollars a month um uh, which is a sort of a price of a cup of coffee um, uh, and there are other packages available and there is a lot of content coming down the pipe I've been working a lot on the stuff for the rats in the walls and there will be more stuff on this channel from uh, the bearded wit uh, once we get through the rest of, of this and mostly harmless which is the next book in the series so if you could support um, if you have the the excess uh, in your monthly outgoings to be able to do that it makes it much easier for me to keep doing this kind of stuff and to keep the uh, the the engine running so do if you can pop over to patreon.com uh, forward slash the bearded wit uh, and make a contribution uh, and get that with my thanks and also drop me a line I, I get regular messages from you and um, I mean it, it, it blows my mind that uh, I'm, I'm heard literally all over the world now um, which is deeply humbling uh, and so do keep your messages coming I do try to answer all of them personally I don't think there's anyone that I haven't responded to if I have I'm really sorry I'll get round to it uh, but thanks very much for the support, uh, both in terms of your good messages and those that have signed up as patrons on patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit. Right, so to the events of this evening. Where we got to last week, we have been following Arthur and uh, his, his new love, um, uh, Fenchurch, uh, who he has met since returning to sort of Earth Mark II, and they found themselves as having something of a curious sort of what's the word? Co- well, yes, yeah, coincidences, but but basically they are connected in some way, shape, or form. And we've discovered in previous episodes that actually Fenchurch's feet don't touch the floor. 
My that is, we don't quite know. Well, we do, because she's the one that at the first, very first book, she was the person who had the actual revelation um, before the Vogons destroyed Earth Mark I. Um, so there's some weirdness going on, uh, and and uh, the more that Fenchurch and Arthur have talked to each other, they've been off to see Wonko the Sane in California, they've returned, they've got back to his... his uh, his little cottage uh, to find Ford Prefect smashing the place up, trying to reenact how fabulous he's been uh, in trying to defeat the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation. And he stowed away on a flying saucer, which has caused a bit of a hoo ha because it's landed in the centre of London. And that's where we pick the story up. So, once again, settle back. I'm going to have a quick slurp of tea. You do the same. Um, we'll see how far we get this evening. We're, we're quite close to the end of So Long and Thanks for All the Fish. If it if it kind of finishes up with a shorter one because that's that's convenient, we'll do that and then we'll leap into Mostly Harmless uh, next week. Uh, but if we've got a lot of time uh, left, we might start Mostly Harmless uh, and crack on into it. But um, let's finish off, for a starter, let's finish off um, So Long and Thanks for All the Fish. So... Tea. Oh dear God, I love tea. Right. Are you all sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. The flying saucer in which Ford Prefect had stowed away had stunned the world. Finally, there was no doubt, no possibility of mistake, no hallucinations, no mysterious CIA agents finding, found floating in reservoirs. This time it was real. It was definite. It was quite definitely definite. It had come down with a wonderful disregard for anything beneath it and crushed a large area of some of the most expensive real estate in the world – including much of Harrods. The thing was massive, nearly a mile across, some said, dull silver in colour, pitted, scorched and disfigured, with the scars of unnumbered vicious space battles fought with savage forces by the light of suns unknown to man. A hatchway opened, crashed down through the Harrods food halls, demolished Harvey Nichols, and with a final grinding scream of tortured architecture, toppled the Sheraton Park Tower. After a long, heart-stopping moment of internal crashes and grumbles of rending machinery, there marched from it, down the ramp, an immense silver robot. A hundred feet tall. It held up a hand. I come in peace, it said, adding, after a long moment of further grinding, take me to your lizard. Ford Prefect, of course, had an explanation for this. As he sat with Arthur and watched the non-stop frenetic news reports on the television, none of which had anything to say, other to say, than to record that the thing had done this amount of damage, which was valued at that amount of billions of pounds, and had killed this totally other number of people. And then say it again, because the robot was doing nothing more than standing there, swaying very slightly, and emitting short, incomprehensible error messages. It comes from a very ancient democracy, you see. You mean, it, it comes from a world of lizards? No, said Ford, who by this time was a little more rational and coherent than he had been, having finally had the coffee forced down him. Nothing so simple, nothing anything like so straightforward. On its world, the people are people, the leaders are lizards. The people hate the lizards, and the lizards rule the people. "'Odd,' said Arthur. "'I thought you said it was a democracy.' "'I did,' said Ford. "'It is.' "'So,' said Arthur, "'hoping he wasn't sounding ridiculously obtuse, "'why don't people get rid of the lizards?' "'It honestly doesn't occur to them,' said Ford. "'They've all got the vote, "'so they've all pretty much assuming "'that the government that they voted in "'more or less approximates to the government they want.' You mean, you mean they actually vote for the lizards? 
Oh, yes, said Ford, with a shrug. Of course. But, said Arthur, going for the big one again, why? Because if they didn't vote for a lizard, said Ford, the wrong lizard might get in. Got any gin? What? I said, said Ford, with an increasing air of urgency creeping into his voice, have you got any gin? I'll look. Tell me about the lizards. Ford shrugged again. Some people say that the lizards are the best thing that ever happened to them, he said. They're completely wrong, of course, completely and utterly wrong, but somebody's got to say it. But that's terrible, said Arthur. Listen, bud, said Ford, if I had one Altarian dollar for every time I heard one bit of the universe look at another bit of the universe and say, that's terrible, I wouldn't be sitting here like a lemon looking for a gin. But I haven't, and I am. Anyway, why are you looking so placid and, and moon-eyed? Are you in love? Arthur said yes, he was, and said it placidly. With someone who knows where the gin bottle is, do I get to meet her? He did, because Fenchurch came in at that moment with a pile of newspapers she'd been into the village to buy. She stopped in astonishment at the wreckage on the table and the wreckage from Beetlejuice on the sofa. "'Where's the gin?' said Ford to Fenchurch and to Arthur. "'What happened to Trillian, by the way?' "'Uh, this is Fenchurch,' said Arthur awkwardly. "'There was nothing with Trillian. You must have seen her last.' "'Oh, yeah,' said Ford. "'She went off with Zaphod somewhere. "'They had some kids or something. "'At least,' he added, "'I think it's that. that's what they were. "'Zaphod's calmed down a lot, you know.' "'Really?' said Arthur, "'clustering hurriedly round Fenchurch "'to relieve her of the shopping. "'Yeah,' said Ford. "'At least one of his heads is now saner "'than an emu on acid.' "'Arthur,' said Fenchurch, who is this? Ford Prefect, said Arthur. I may have mentioned him passing. Mentioned him in passing. For a total of three days and nights, the giant silver robot stood in stunned amazement, straddling the remains of, of Knightbridge. Sway Knights Oh, I'll try that again. Sorry, folks. For a total of three days and nights, the giant silver robot stood in stunned amazement, straddling the remains of Knightsbridge, swaying slightly and trying to work out a number of things. Government deputations came to see it. Ranting journalists by the truckload asked each other questions on the air about what they thought of it. Flights of fighter bombers tried pathetically to attack it. But no... Lizards appeared. It scanned the horizon slowly. At night, it was at its most spectacular, floodlit by the teams of television crews who covered it continuously, as it continuously did nothing. It thought and thought, and eventually reached a conclusion. It would have to send out its service robots. It should have thought of that before, but it was having a number of problems. The tiny flying robots came screeching out of the hatchway one afternoon in a terrifying cloud of metal. They roamed the surrounding terrain, frantically attacking some things and defending others. One of them at last found a pet shop with some lizards, but it instantly defended the pet shop for democracy so savagely that little in the area survived. A turning point came when a crack team of flying screechers discovered the zoo in Regent's Park, and most particularly the reptile house. Leaning a little sorry, learning a little caution from their previous mistakes in the pet shop, the flying drills and fretsaws brought some of the larger and fatter iguanas to the giant silver robot, who tried to conduct high-level talks with them. Eventually, the robot announced to the world that, despite the full, frank and wide-ranging exchange of views, the high-level talks had broken down. 
the lizards had been retired, and that it, the robot, would take a short holiday somewhere, and for some reason it selected Bournemouth. Ford Prefect, watching it on TV, nodded, laughed, and had another beer. Immediate preparations were made for its departure. The flying toolkits screeched and sawed and drilled and fried things with light, with light throughout that day and all through the night time, and in the morning, stunningly, a giant mobile gantry started to roll westwards on several roads simultaneously, with the robot standing on it, supported within the gantry. Westward it crawled, like a strange carnival, buzzed around by its servants and helicopters and news coaches, scything through the land until at last it came to Bournemouth, where the robot slowly freed itself of its transport system's embraces and went and lay for ten days on the beach. It was, of course, by far the most exciting thing that had ever happened to Bournemouth. Crowds gathered daily along the perimeter, which was staked out and guarded as the robot's re recreation area, and tried to see what it was doing. It was doing nothing. It was lying on the beach. It was lying a little awkwardly on its face. It was a journalist from a local paper who, late one night, managed to do what no one else in the world had so far managed, which was to strike up a brief, intelligible conversation with one of the service robots guarding the perimeter. It was an extraordinary breakthrough. "'I think there's a story in it,' confided the journalist over a cigarette shared through the steel link fence. "'But it needs a good local angle. I've got a little list of questions here.' he went on, rummaging awkwardly in his inner pocket. Perhaps you could get it him. Um, whatever you call him. Well, if you could get him to run through them quickly. The little flying ratchet screwdriver said it would see what it could do, and screeched off. A reply was never forthcoming. Curiously, however, the questions on the piece of paper more or less exactly matched the questions that were going through the massive, battle-scarred, industrial-quality circuits of the robot's mind. They were these. How do you feel about being a robot? How does it feel to be from outer space? And how do you like Bournemouth? Early the following day, things started to be packed up, and within a few days it became apparent that the robot was preparing to leave for good. The point is, said Fenchurch to Ford, can you get us on board? Ford looked wildly at his watch. I have some serious unfinished business to attend to, he exc exclaimed. Crowds thronged as close as they could to the giant silver craft, which wasn't very. The immediate perimeter fence was fenced off and patrolled by the tiny flying service robots. Staked out around that was the army, who had been completely unable to breach that inner perimeter, but were damned if anyone was going to breach them. They, in turn, were surrounded by a cordon of police though whether they were there to protect the public from the army or the army from the public, or to guarantee the giant ship diplomatic immunity and prevent it from getting parking tickets, was entirely unclear, and the subject indeed of much debate. The inner perimeter fence was now being dismantled. The army stirred uncomfortably, uncertain of how to react to the fact that the reason for their being there seemed as if it was simply going to get up and go. The giant robot had lurched back aboard the ship at lunchtime, and now it was five o'clock in the afternoon, and no further sign had been seen of it. Much had been heard, more grindings and rumblings from deep within the craft, the music of a million hideous malfunctions, but the sense of tense expectation among the crowd was born of the fact that they tensely expected to be disappointed. This wonderful, extraordinary thing had come into their lives, 
and now it was simply going to go without them. Two people were particularly aware of this sensation. Arthur and Fenchurch scanned the crowd anxiously, unable to find Ford Prefect in it anywhere, or any sign that he had the slightest intention of being there. "'How reliable is he?' asked Fenchurch in a sinking voice. "'How, how reliable?' said Arthur, giving a hollow laugh. "'How shallow is the ocean?' he said. "'How cold is the sun?' The last parts of the robot's gantry transport were being carried on board, and the few remaining sections of the perimeter fence were now stacked at the bottom of the ramp, waiting to follow them. The soldiers on guard around the ramp bristled meaningfully. Orders were barked back and forth. Hurried conferences were held. But nothing, of course, could be done about any of it. Hopelessly, and with no clear plan now, Arthur and Fenchurch pushed forward through the, the crowd. But since the whole crowd was also trying to push forward through the crowd, this got them nowhere. Within a few minutes, more nothing remained outside the ship. Every last link of the fence was aboard. A couple of flying fret saws and a spirit level seemed to do one last check around the site, and then screamed in through the giant hatchway themselves. A few seconds passed. The sounds of mechanical disarray from within changed in intensity, and slowly, heavily, the huge steel ramp began to lift itself back out of the Harrods' food halls. The sound that accompanied it was the sound of thousands of tense, excited people being completely ignored. Hold it! A megaphone barked from a taxi, which screeched to a halt on the edge of the milling crowd. There has been, barked the megaphone, a major scientific break-in. Uh, through. Breakthrough, it corrected itself. The door flew open, and a small man from somewhere in the vicinity of Beetlejuice leapt out wearing a white coat. Hold it, he shouted again, and this time brandished a short, squat black rod with lights on it. The lights winked briefly. The ramp paused in its ascent, and then, in obedience to the signals from the thumb, which half the electronic engineers in the galaxy are constantly trying to find fresh ways of jamming, while the other half are constantly trying to find fresh ways of jamming the jamming signals, slowly ground its way downwards again. Ford Prefect grabbed his megaphone from out of the taxi and started bawling at the crowd through it. Make way, he shouted. Make way, please. This is a major scientific breakthrough. You and you get the equipment from the taxi. Completely at random, he pointed at Arthur and Fenchurch, who wrestled their way back out of the crowd and clustered urgently around the taxi. All right, I want you to clear a passage, please, for some important pieces of scientific equipment boomed Ford. Just everybody keep calm. It's all under control. There's nothing to see. It is merely a major scientific breakthrough. Keep calm. Keep calm. Keep calm. Important scientific equipment. Clear the way. Hungry for new excitement, delighted at this sudden reprieve from disappointment, the crowd enthusiastically fell back and started to open up. Arthur was a little surprised to see what was printed on the boxes of important scientific equipment in the back of the taxi. Hang your coat over them, he muttered to Fenchurch as he heaved them out to her. Hurriedly, he manoeuvred the large supermarket trolley that was also jammed against the back seat. It clattered to the ground, and together they loaded the boxes into it. Clear a path, please, shouted Ford again. Everything is under proper scientific control. He said you pay, said the taxi driver to Arthur, who dug out some notes and paid him. There was a distant sound of police sirens. Move along there, shouted Ford, and no one will get hurt. The crowd surged and closed behind them again as frantically they pushed and hauled the rattling supermarket trolley through the rubble towards the ramp. It's all right, continued Ford. 
There's nothing to see. It's all over. None of this is actually happening. Clear the way, please, boomed a police megaphone from the back of the crowd. There's been a break-in. Clear the way. Breakthrough, yelled Ford in competition. A scientific breakthrough. This is the police. Clear the way. Scientific equipment, clear the way. Police, let us through. Walkman, yelled Ford, and pulled half a dozen miniature tape players from his pockets and tossed them into the crowd. The resulting seconds of utter confusion allowed them to get the supermarket trolley to the edge of the ramp and to haul it up on the lip of it. Hold tight, muttered Ford, and released, hit a, bu re and released a button on his electronic thumb. Beneath them, the huge ramp juddered and began slowly to heave its way upwards. OK, kids, he said as the milling crowd dropped away beneath them and they started to lurch their way along the tilting ramp into the bowels of the ship. It looks like we're on our way. Arthur Dent was irritated to be continually wakened by the sound of gunfire. Being careful not to wake Fenchurch, who was still managing to sleep fitfully, he slid his way out of the maintenance hatchway which they'd fashioned into a kind of bunk for themselves, slung himself down the access ladder and prowled the corridors moodily. They were claustrophobic and ill-lit. The lighting circuits buzzed annoyingly. That wasn't it, though. He paused and leaned backwards as a flying power drill flew past him down the dim corridor with a nasty screech, occasionally clanging against the walls like a very confused bee as it did so. That wasn't it either. He clambered through a bulkhead door and found himself in a large corridor. Acrid smoke was drifting up from one end, so he walked towards the other. He came to an observation monitor let into the wall behind a plate of toughened, but still badly scratched, perspex. "'Would you turn it down, please?' he said to Ford Prefect, who was crouching in front of it in the middle of a pile of bits of video equipment he'd taken from a shop window in Tottenham Court Road, having first hurled a small brick through it, and also a nasty heap of empty beer cans. Shh, hissed Ford, and peered with manic concentration at the screen. He was watching the Magnificent Seven. Just a bit, said Arthur. No, shouted Ford. We're just getting to the good bit. Listen, I finally got it all sorted out. Voltage levels, line conversion, everything. And this, this is the good bit. With a sigh and a headache, Arthur sat down beside him and watched the good bit. He listened to Ford's whoops and yells and yeehaws as placidly as he could. Ford, he said eventually when it was all over, and Ford was hunting through a stack of cassettes for the tape of Casablanca, how come if... This is the big one said Ford. This is the one I came back for. Do you realise, do you realise I never saw it all through? I always missed the end. I saw half of it again the night before the Vogons came. When they blew the place up, I thought I'd never get to see it. Hey, what happened with all that anyway? Just life, said I and plucked a beer from the six-pack. Oh, that again, said Ford. I thought it might be something like that. I prefer this stuff, he said as Rick's bar flickered onto the screen. How come if what? What? You started to say, how come if? Yeah, how come if you're so rude about the earth that you... Oh, never mind. Let's just watch the movie. Exactly, said Ford. There remains little still to tell, beyond what is what used to be known as the limitless light fields of Flanux, until the grey binding fiefdoms of Saxaquine were discovered lying behind them lie the great grey binding fiefdoms of Saxaquine. 
Within the grey binding fiefdoms of Saxaquine lies the star named Zars, around which orbits the planet Preliumtarn, on which is the land of Saverby Upstream. And it was to the land of Saverby Upstream that Arthur and Fenchurch came at last, a little tired by the journey. And in the land of Saverby Upstream, they came to the great red plain of Raz, which was bounded on the south side by the Quenchulus Quasgar Mountains, on the further side of which, according to the dying words of Prack, they would find, in thirty-foot-high letters of fire, God's final message to his creation. According to Prack, if Arthur's memory served him right, the place was guarded by the majestic Vantrachel of Lob, and so, after a manner, it proved to be. He was a little man, in a strange hat, and he sold them a ticket. "'Keep to the left, please,' he said. "'Keep to the left,' and hurried on past them on a little scooter. They realised that they were not the first to pass that way, for the path that had led round the left of the Great Plain was well worn and dotted with booths. At one they bought a box of fudge, which had been baked in an oven on a, in a cave in the mountain, which was heated by the fire of the letters that formed God's final message to his creation. At another they bought some postcards, the letters had been blurred with an airbrush, so as not to spoil the big surprise, it said on the reverse. Do you know what the message is? They asked the wizened little lady in the booth. Oh, oh yes, she piped cheerily. Oh, yes. She waved them on. Every twenty miles or so there was a little stone hut with showers and sanitary facilities, but the going was tough, and the high sun baked down on the great red plain, and the great red plain rippled in the heat. "'Is it possible,' asked Arthur at one of the larger booths, "'to rent one of those little scooters, like the one the majestic Ventra Watts it had?' The scooters, said the little lady who was serving at the ice cream bar, are not for the devout. Oh, well, that's easy then, said Fenchurch. We're not particularly devout. We're just interested. Then you must turn back now, said the lady severely. And when they demurred, sold them a couple of final message sun hats and a photograph of themselves with their arms tight around each other, on the great red plain of Raz. They drank a couple of sodas in the shade of the booth, and then trudged out into the sun again. "'We're running out of barrier cream,' said Fenchurch, after a few more miles. "'We can go to the next booth, or we can return to the previous one, which is nearer, but it means we have to retrace our steps.' They stared ahead at the distant black speck, winking in the heat haze and they looked behind themselves. They elected to go on. They then discovered that they were not the only... Sorry, that they were not... Sorry. They then discovered that they were not only the, not the first to make this journey, but they, they were not the only ones making it now. Some way ahead of them, an awkward, low shape was heaving itself wretchedly along the ground, stumbling painfully slowly, half limping, half crawling. It was moving so slowly that before too long they caught the creature up, and could see that it was made of worn, scarred and twisted metal. It groaned at them as they approached it, collapsing in the hot, dry dust. So much time, it groaned. Oh, so much time. And pain as well. So much of that. And so much time to suffer it in, 
two. One or the other on its own I could probably manage. It's the two together that really get me down. Oh, hello. You again. Marvin? said Arthur sharply, crouching down beside it. Is, is that you? You were always one, groaned the aged husk of the robot, for the super-intelligent question, weren't you? What is it? whispered Fenchurch in alarm, crouching behind Arthur and grasping on to his arm. He's, he's sort of an old friend, said Arthur. I... Friend? croaked the robot pathetically. The word died away in a kind of cackle and crackle and flakes of rust fell out in his mouth. You'll have to excuse me while I try and remember what the word means. My memory banks are not what they were, you know, and any word which falls into disuse for a few zillion years has to get shifted down into auxiliary memory backup. Ah, oh, here it comes. The robot's battered head snapped up a bit as if in thought. Hmm he said. What a curious concept. He thought a little longer. No, he said at last. Don't think I ever came across one of those. Sorry, can't help you there. He scraped a knee pathetically in the dust and then tried to twist himself up onto his misshapen elbows. Is there any last service you would like me to perform for you, perhaps? He asked in a kind of hollow rattle. A piece of paper that perhaps you would like me to pick up for you. Or maybe you'd like me, he continued, to open a door. His head scratched around in its rusty neck bearings and seemed to scan the distant horizon. Don't seem to be any doors around at present, he said, but I'm sure that if we waited long enough, someone would build one. And then, he said, slowly twisting his head around to see Arthur again, I could open it for you. I'm quite used to waiting, you know. Arthur, hissed Fenchurch in his ear sharply, you never told me of this. What have you done to this poor creature? Nothing, insisted Arthur sadly. He's always like this. Huh, snapped Marvin. Huh, he repeated. What do you know of always? You say always to me, who, because of the silly little errands you organic life forms keep sending me on through time, am now thirty seven times older than the universe itself. Pick your words with a little more care. He coughed and tacked. He rasped his way through a coughing fit and resumed. Leave me, he said. Go on ahead. Leave me to struggle painfully on my way. My time at last is nearly come. My race is nearly run. I fully expect, he said, feebly waving them on with a broken finger, to come in last. It would be fitting. Here I am, brain the size. Between them, they picked him up, and despite his feeble protests and insults, 
The metal was so hot it nearly blistered their fingers, but he weighed surprisingly little and hung limply between their arms. They carried him along the path that ran along the left of the great red plains of Ras towards the encircling mountains of Quenchilus Quasgar. Arthur attempted to explain to Fenchurch, but was too often interrupted by Marvin's dolorous cybernetic ravings. They tried to see if they could get him some spare parts at one of the booths and some soothing oil, but Marvin would have none of it. I'm all spare parts, he droned. Let me be, he groaned. Every part of me, he moaned, has been replaced at least fifty times. Except... He seemed almost imperceptibly to brighten for a moment. His head bobbed between them with the effort of memory. Do you remember the first time you ever met me? He said at last to Arthur. I had been given the intellect-stretching task of taking you up to the bridge. I mentioned to you that I had this terrible pain in all the diodes down my left side, that I'd asked for them to be replaced, but they never were. He left a longish pause before he continued. They carried him on between them, under the baking sun that hardly ever seemed to move, let alone set. Her, see if you can guess, said Marvin, when he judged that the pause had become embarrassing enough. Which parts of me were never replaced? Go on, see if you can guess. Ouch, he added. Ouch, 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 ouch. At last they reached the last of the little booths, set Marvin down between them and rested in the shade. Fenchurch bought some cufflinks for Russell, cufflinks that had set in them little polished pebbles which had been picked from the quenchless Quasgar Mountains directly underneath the letters of fire in which was written God's final message to his creation. Arthur flipped through a little rack of devotional tracts on the counter, little meditations on the meaning of the message. Ready? he said to Fenchurch, who nodded. They heaved Martin Marvin up between them. They rounded the foot of the Quenchilus Quasgar Mountains, and there was the message, written in blazing letters across the crest of the mountain. There was a little observation vantage point, with a rail built along the top of the large rock facing it, from which you could get a good view. It had a little pay telescope for looking at the letters in detail, but no one would ever use it because the letters burned with the divine brilliance of the heavens and would, if seen through a telescope, have severely damaged the retina and optic nerve. They gazed at God's final message in wonderment and were slowly and ineffably filled with a great sense of peace and of final and complete understanding. Fenchurch sighed. Yes, she said, that was it. They had been staring at it for fully ten minutes before they became aware that Marvin, hanging between their shoulders, was in difficulties. The robot could no longer lift his head and not read the message. They lifted his head, but he complained that his vision circuits had almost gone. They found a coin and helped him to the telescope. He complained and insulted them, but they helped him look at each individual letter in turn. 
The first letter was a W, the second an E. Then there was a gap. An A followed, and then a P, an O, and an I. L, sorry. Marvin paused for a rest. After a few moments, they resumed, and let him see the O, and the G, and the I, and the S, and the E. The next two words were for and the. The last one was a long one, and Marvin needed another rest before he could tackle it. It began with an I, then an N, and then a C. Next came an O and an N, followed by a V, an E, another N, and an I. After a final pause, Marvin gathered his strength for the last stretch. He read the E, the N, the C, and at last the final E, and staggered back into their arms. I think, he murmured at last, from deep within his corroding, rattling thorax, I feel good about it. The lights went out in his eyes for absolutely the very last time ever. We apologise for the inconvenience. Luckily, there was a stall nearby where you could rent scooters from guys with green wings. Epilogue one of the greatest benefactors of all lifekind was a man who couldn't keep his mind on the job in hand. Brilliant? Certainly. One of the foremost genetic engineers of his or any other generation, including a number he had designed himself. Without a doubt. The problem was that he was now far too interested in things which he shouldn't be interested in. At least, as people would tell him, not now. He was also, partly because of this, of a rather irritable disposition. So, when his world was threatened by terrible invaders from a distant star, who were still a fair way off but travelling fast, he, Blart Versenwald III, his name was Blart Versenwald III, which is not strictly relevant but quite interesting because, never mind, that was his name and we can talk about why it's interesting later. He was sent into guarded seclusion by the masters of his race with instructions to design a breed of fanatical super-warriors to resist and vanquish the feared invaders. Do it quickly and, they told him, concentrate. So he sat by a window and looked out at a summer lawn and designed and designed and designed but inevitably got a little distracted by things, and by the time the invaders were practically in orbit around them, had come up with a remarkable new breed of superfly that could, unaided, figure out how to fly through the open half of a half-open window and also an off-switch for children. Celebrations of these remarkable achievements seemed doomed to be short-lived because disaster was imminent as the alien ships were landing. But astoundingly, the fearsome invaders who, like most warlike races, were only on the rampage because they couldn't cope with things at home, were stunned by Versenwald's extraordinary breakthroughs. And they joined in the celebrations and were instantly prevailed upon to sign a wide-ranging series of trading agreements and set up a programme of cultural exchanges instead. And, in an astonishing reversal of no normal practice, the conduct of such matters everybody concerned, genuinely lived happily ever after. There was a point to this story, but it's temporarily escaped the chronicler's mind. And that 
is where we shall leave it for this evening. That is the end of So Long and Thanks for All the Fish. I think this is a fantastic uh, round off with God's last message to his creation. <laughs> we apologise for the inconvenience. Um, thank you very much for staying with us so far on this. Um, we will start next week on the last book written by Douglas Adams in the Hitchhikers series. Um, mostly harmless. Uh, it will be the same time, same place. Uh, 2100 CET. Again, please do support the podcast by going over to patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit and signing up to become a patron um, from $5 a month. That would be brilliant if you can do that. I do appreciate it. Um, and thank you to everyone that's already doing so. I will give you name checks in the uh, episode next week. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, look after yourselves. Um, be good to yourselves. Be good to everyone around you. Um, and have a great week. And I will see you uh, next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye now.